Welcome to the January 2022 virtual community lecture series. Way back when, these used to be in-person community lecture series, which were awesome. And we used to be able to sit around in a cool little place and you'd get to bump elbows and shake hands with doctors and ask questions and things, which was really fun. Um, so we do have a handful of community members and I see a few familiar names. So thank you to the attendees for joining. I'll just go through a few quick logistics and then I'll introduce, um, we have two guest speakers tonight, which is exciting. So um, from the logistics standpoint, you'll notice if you're an attendee that this is a webinar format, so you won't have the option to unmute yourself just yet. Um, but at the bottom of most screens, sometimes on an iPad, it's at the top, you'll see a little chat bubble and a little Q&A that has two bubbles. So you can click on either one of those. I'll have those open and I'll moderate those. So if you have any questions, comments, things like that, this is a great opportunity for you to be able to ask questions of the docs, kind of get some idea of what they do and bounce a few questions off of them. And so um, hopefully we can kind of make this a little interactive and you can also ask me questions. Um, for those that I don't know, my name is Jeff Gaines. I'm an emergency doc by background, but I'm now the chief medical officer at Newport Hospital. And so lots going on over at the hospital. Um, and it always is exciting to be able to introduce some new docs. And so we have two um, new docs that joined our medical staff within the last year. Um, the first of those by alphabetical order, just for the fun of it, um, is Dr. Archin Krupadev. Um, so Archin is with LPG in our primary care space. She is from Ohio and went to Ohio State University and got her bachelor's degree there. I won't talk too much about it because I'm a Michigan guy, so we'll gloss over the Ohio State part really quickly and move on. Um, then she got her um, doctorate degree from the Ross University School of Medicine and then went to Mercy Catholic Medical Center in Philly um, and did her internal medicine residency. Um, just finished that up pretty recently. And so then we got her from there. Um, she's written some pieces for us about sleep, um, which was kind of a fun one to read. And she's done some research on vaccines and social media. So a couple of things I have some notes to pick her brain about because those are some pretty relevant topics these days. Um, and so we're excited to have her join the medical staff and our primary care team. So um, I know she has a lot of interests in primary care and preventative care and keeping people healthy in this community and others. Um, and then the second doc that we've welcomed recently is Dr. Ross Barker. Um, so Dr. Barker is an interventional pain management physician. Um, he did some time at Emory and got his bachelor's degree there, um, then went over to Boston U and got a master's degree. He's kind of from the area, went to University of New England College of Osteopathic Medicine in Maine to get his doctorate degree, um, then went off to Tufts uh, School of Med and St. Elizabeth's Medical Center in Boston to do his anesthesia residency and was the chief resident there, and then did pain medicine fellowship at Harvard Med School in the BI Deaconess. So he is an anesthesia pain doc, um, which is something that's pretty cool when you run a hospital to have one of those around, but a lot of people don't necessarily, right off the top of their head, necessarily know um, some of the procedures and cool stuff that Dr. Barker and his team does. So that was part of the reason why I wanted to have him on board so he could talk a little bit about some of those. And he has a few visuals and stuff um, to share because he does a lot of work around the spine, so that'll be helpful for folks to understand. So a huge thank you to Dr. Krupadev and to Dr. Barker for joining and welcome to Newport Hospital and to Lifespan. Um, much appreciated. So what I might do just to kind of kick things off, maybe I'll start with Dr. Barker, because I know you have a few slides and stuff. You can kind of go through some visuals and what um, it is that you're up to. I'll give you a few to chat and then I'll kick it over to Dr. Krupadev. Um, I would be curious to hear what's going on in primary care these days. Maybe we can talk a little about virtual visits and seeing a doctor without having to leave the house, stuff like that. Um, does that sound reasonable to you guys? Awesome. Yeah, and then sure. For the attendees, just remember the chat box, the Q&A box. At any point, you feel free to ask questions. Um, what I can do is uh, when we get a little breather in a presentation, I can interrupt and ask questions or we can save them to the end, depending on the flow. Um, but feel free to pop some questions in because it'll be a good chance for you to ask those. And I'm happy to field them whenever I can. So I am just gonna pop up Dr. Barker's slideshow, which you should be seeing now. And then I will drive the slides whenever we're ready. You can see them okay, Ross? Yeah, perfect, thank you. All right, take it away. All righty, well, um, happy to be here. Thanks for the kind introduction, uh, Dr. Um, we can head to the next slide. And I know you did touch upon uh, my background here. I Just to add a little bit uh, kind of personal detail to that, I, I grew up outside of the Boston area, west of Boston, about a half an hour. Um, and, and like Dr. Gaines mentioned, I spent my, my college years down at Emory in Georgia um, and essentially have been back, back, returned to the Boston area to kind of complete all of my medical training um, 
after which uh, my wife and I actually went out to, to Scottsdale to uh, where I practiced in private practice for about four years uh, before returning to the East Coast uh, back in or actually in August of, of last year uh, to be closer to family. So we're really thrilled to be become part of the uh, Quidnick Island uh, Newport community. Um, and, and it's been uh, great, uh, you know, being being back here and close to friends and family. So um we can go to the next slide. And so I put some slides, just a few slides together tonight to kind of uh, just point out some of the main features um, of, of what one, what I do and, and, and some of the chronic pain conditions that, that we see often uh, here at the Norman Prince uh, Spine Institute at Newport Hospital. Um, and I also wanted to touch upon some of the common conditions uh, and as well as the common interventional treatments that that I have uh, that we have to offer uh, essentially uh, services and care to the community uh, some of which many you may be uh, well aware of and others uh, maybe not so much and so that that's really what this is uh, intended for uh, to kind of begin that conversation and um, bring some awareness uh, next slide so I I just wanted to quickly touch base on the this this slide here which really highlights the, the prevalence of chronic pain I, I think it's something that um, some of us experience almost all of us experience pain at some point in our lives and really you know to emphasize the fact that 80 percent of us will have neck or back back pain at some point in our lifetime is uh, is, is quite impressive um, it's low back pain is the first number one cause for disability and in one area that I often like to emphasize is how chronic pain can, can often manifest, not just where the original pain uh, is stemming from, but how it can manifest both physically and mentally um, over time can really affect our, our quality of life and, uh, and our function. And, and so that's really uh, the, the main goal of, of what we do at the Norman Prince Fine Institute is to try to uh, target and figure out what's driving these symptoms and, and, and provide some options for patients. So next slide. So this slide basically touches upon the, the comprehensive care model um, and really one of the most appealing aspects uh, I feel uh, of our center, uh, Newport Hospital. Uh, it's really a, a patient centric model. Uh, it, and it's, the reason I put all this together here on this slide is to show that there are a number of resources available uh, to patients uh, kind of under one roof, if you will. And um, oftentimes we incorporate some of these or, or all of these to, to kind of help with patients uh, in, in getting them uh, better. And um, the, the highlighted one there, minimally invasive interventions, is really the, the, one of the main focuses uh, tonight and, and is really my role among the other team members, if you will, um, to really offer a wide scope of non-surgical uh, interventional procedures, which are often very effective at, at hopefully keeping patients out of the out of the operating room and and, and getting them back to their uh, desired activities. Uh, next slide. So, what can you expect during your first visit um, at, at our center? If you uh, make an appointment, what are the kind of things to you know, expect or anticipate? Well, first, really the history and physical exam. And, and that's when you come in and, and we sit down uh, for 40 minutes and that's the time to understand what, what issues or what symptoms you're having, uh, when these symptoms began, et cetera, and, and try to really understand how it's affecting your life and, and, and what you uh, like to do and what maybe you might be missing out on uh, because of your pain, whether it be back pain, neck pain, et cetera. The next thing we do is, you know, discuss if there are any diagnostic studies that may be uh, meaningful to gain a little bit more insight into one's condition. These might be x-rays, MRI studies, um, to really look at the anatomy and figure out uh, next steps. Uh, the, the next point, or next uh, bullet rather, uh, goals, is, is really a, a critical piece of the kind of interaction that, that we have. And my, one of my uh, objectives is to really find out what it is exactly that is 
causing you to you know miss those desired activities or whether that's you know playing tennis going for a walk and and what's you know what kind of things you want to get back to and, and that's something that we would discuss together um as i think that's a critical component to really developing an individual individualized treatment plan um so that we can work together you know step by step and, and, and get you back uh, feeling better uh, next slide so this slide is a overview of some of the most common spinal conditions that uh, I see um, as a spine, man uh, spine and pain management uh, doctor. We see a lot of uh, degenerative disc disease and arthritis. Oftentimes that presents with a dull ache, whether it be in the neck or the lower back, often worse with activity and oftentimes very progressive. As we get older, as we, uh, you know, as, as there's more wear and tear in our spine, we, we tend to have fluctuating uh, pain oftentimes in the, in the spine. And, and oftentimes this is secondary to degenerative changes. Um, radiculopathy, often referred to as sciatica, is uh, when you start to have pain or it could be even tingling, numbness, weakness, even occasionally going down an arm or a leg. And this is often driven by an irritation of a nerve uh, in, the, in the spine. Um, spinal stenosis is a very common condition where there is some narrowing in the spinal canal and often that will present with pain, uh, oftentimes in the lower back or even in the legs with activity, with walking that alleviates or gets better with sitting. We also see patients who have had previous back surgeries, uh, sometimes multiple back surgeries and either did well for a while and pain starts to return or maybe never uh, improve following surgery. And, and um, in addition to that, we see uh, spine trauma, fractures. If there's a fracture in any of the bones of the spine, there are various treatments that we have to offer for that as well. Uh, so next slide. And I did just want to, uh, I did want to include an additional slide here to just comment on uh, other conditions that we do see in a, uh, as well as uh, in addition to the two spine, uh, such as headaches, oftentimes that are driven by the cervical spine or the neck. Uh, we see a lot of peripheral joint pain from arthritis, whether that's hip, knee, shoulders. Um, and we do offer some alternative treatments for those as well if patients are are continuing to have pain. And again, this could be even after a total knee replacement. We do offer other kind of procedures that can assist with um, improving pain and function after a knee replacement. Uh, next slide. And so this is kind of the last slide that we have to just list the some of the most common spine procedures that we do, uh, or that I do, I should say. Um, this is kind of a quick overview. And, and some of you may be very familiar with uh, these procedures or may have friends or family who have undergone some of these procedures uh, from epidural injections and, and other kind of joint injections in your spine. And I'd be happy to kind of dive a little bit deeper and, and discuss these, um, you know, during the, the Q&A if anyone has any further questions. But I just wanted to kind of put this up there as some of the uh, most common uh, interventional options that, that, we, that we have to offer. All right, next slide. And I think that sums up the uh, brief slide deck that I wanted to put together for tonight and um, really open it up to questions whenever uh, is best for Dr. Gaines. Awesome. Thanks, Ross. Appreciate going through that. So Dr. Barker can be found right off the main lobby in the hospital, the Norm Norman Prince Spine Institute is really right off the main entrance. Um, and then he does a lot of those procedures that he mentioned up in our procedure rooms in the operating room. So all based really within the hospital. So it's great to have him uh, in the hospital proper. And then just down the street is where our primary care office space is. And that's where Dr. Krupadev does her work. So um, what I might do, let me kick it over to Dr. Krupadev to kind of chat a little bit about, maybe you could tell um, the community kind of uh, your story about how you ended up with your training and landing in Rhode Island, and then maybe what you've been up to since the fall when you um, started in the primary care space. And then um, we have a few questions that came through ahead of time, and then we'll um, open it up to questions for you guys as well. So Dr. Krupadev, welcome and thanks for joining. Yeah, sure, thank you for having me. 
Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm Archie Krupitev. Um, as Dr. Gaines mentioned, I'm originally from Ohio, uh, just completed my residency in Philadelphia this past summer. Um, to be honest, I was pretty open geographically uh, when I was kind of looking for a job and had, had the chance to visit Newport um, in the previous years and just really loved it. So I was kind of just drawn to this area and, you know, love the summers here um, and, and really enjoying my time here so far. Um, and as far as, you know, primary care, um, you know, a lot of the things that I, I mostly see are, you know, things like diabetes, high blood pressure, um, high cholesterol, um, a lot of, you know, weight counseling, which, you know, kind of ties into all of those three conditions as well. Um, I think another uh, big thing that's kind of, you know, come up, especially, you know, recently with the pandemic is a lot of, you know, mental health, um, like anxiety and depression. Um, so I think, you know, those are kind of the biggest topics that I tend to deal with um, in the primary care setting. Um, and also just a lot of, uh, you know, screening and preventative type uh, things as well, uh, you know, screening for breast cancer, colon cancer. Um, and, you know, a big topic right now is kind of vaccinations as well. Um, so those are the mo most uh, common things that I see in my practice. Excellent. And um, yeah, I'm kind of curious. I know a couple of things that overlap between the two of you. You mentioned weight, um, obviously sort of fitness, exercise, mobility, those sorts of things. So in terms of overall health, that's something both with our workforce and with the patients that we treat, we always try to um, you know, do what we can to make sure we can optimize folks in terms of their mobility and being able to do the things they love to do. I know Dr. Barker mentioned goals and things like that, but um, let's start with Dr. Krupadev. Um, I know you wrote a piece about sleep. That's obviously one of the pillars of sort of good health, but um, anything that uh, you tend to see in particular or things that you tend to do in terms of helping folks understand how best to manage their weight, how to manage their activities, things like that with the hopes of keeping them healthy so they won't necessarily have to go see Dr. Barker and get poked in the back? Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, right now, especially with the cold weather, what I hear from a lot of patients is that, you know, it's just hard to motivate themselves to kind of get going with, you know, a routine uh, in terms of exercise. Um, and I know with COVID right now, you know, people are a little bit hesitant to kind of go to the gyms as well. Um, so, you know, what I usually tell them is just the hardest part is just, you know, getting started. Once you kind of get into a routine, you're more likely to stick with it and it will just kind of become part of your day to day. Um, another thing is, you know, I just tell them, you know, you don't have to spend a lot of money to, you know, sign up for a gym. The easiest thing you can do is just, you know, go for walks around your block or even do, you know, YouTube exercises, um, just things that are easy and accessible uh, for people to do. Um, and then, you know, I think diet is kind of a big thing as well. Um, I, I tend to recommend uh, something called the DASH diet, which is kind of based on the Mediterranean diet. Um, it's, it's nice because it's not so much about reducing or cutting back, but more about, you know, healthy substitutions, um, kind of incorporating more veggies and, you know, kind of easy changes that aren't so much about, you know, making, making dramatic uh, cutbacks in your diet. Nice. Well, sounds like um, some pretty simple things, but it's always amazing how we know what we need to do, but it can sometimes be hard to get around the corner and actually do them. But uh, I imagine Dr. Barker, you know, when um, folks have injuries or uh, maybe have illnesses that can limit their mobility, it can be really tough to kind of uh, break that cycle where it hurts to move and then you don't move and then it gets harder and harder. So um, any suggestions or tricks that you tend to work with your patients and obviously some of your procedures too, to try to help manage their pain and keep them mobile? Absolutely. Um, and, it, you know, I can definitely appreciate, you know, I've always been an active person myself and I think I've been sidelined enough times with injuries to understand and appreciate, you know, when you're not able to do the things you like to do, how much it can affect you um, just kind of across the board. And so we definitely emphasize, uh, you know, the importance of, of activity and, and, um, Oftentimes when patients come to see me with say back or neck pain, you know, physical therapy uh, is, is very often, almost always a, um, a key part of our treatment plan. And um, it's important that even if we do choose to, to try some interventions or procedures that, you know, we're also concurrently doing therapy to try to you know, engage the core or um, other things to help sometimes with weight loss, for instance, to, you know, provide longevity um, so that even if we can assist and sometimes these procedures can facilitate those exercises as well. So they often work really well together um, to, to get patients better. But you're right. It's really important these days, especially with back, most back conditions, 
it, the train of thought years ago was to have be on bed rest and 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 it's very different now it's really you know trying to modify people's activities uh, or their regimen to make sure that they're still active safely um because we know that it is very very important to maintain activity for not just back health or spine health but for obviously overall health too so uh all very much related yeah i totally agree and I kind of always in my own mind felt like if I go to the gym and I pretend like I'm moving my suitcase into my trunk a couple times a week, then when I actually go on vacation and have to try to heft that suitcase in the back of my car, I might be less likely to throw myself out of whack. So at least I've practiced a few times, a little functional exercise. Right? Um, so we have a few questions that are popping up. I just wanted to kind of read off. Um, one of them uh, looks like two for Dr. Barker, but one I can um, kind of bounce off Dr. Grupidev because I'm kind of curious her thought too. Um, one has to do with headaches. So I might start with Dr. Grupidev and then we'll kick it over to Ross. But um, so it says, do, does Newport Hospital have anyone who does cranial therapy for treatment for occipital nerve damage at this time? Um, so that's a pretty specific subset of headaches. We can definitely talk about that. But um, maybe Dr. Krupadev, you can kind of chat a little bit about some of your um, sort of approach to folks that have headaches, whether they be sort of acute or more uh, long, long standing. And then at what point do you kick them over to Dr. Barker? And then maybe Dr. Barker can kind of take it from there as to when you start doing some cool tricks like you guys have. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I do see, you know, quite a bit of patients that have been just kind of dealing with chronic headaches for quite a while now. Um, you know, I think the most important thing is just to determine, you know, if it's affecting their quality of life. You know, a lot of patients tell me they get very debilitating migraines that just kind of put them out for hours. They have to just, you know, sit in a dark room, not really be able to do anything else. Um, so, you know, I think when it gets to that point, um, you know, if, if they've kind of gone through, you know, most of the kind of go-to medications and just aren't really improving, um, you know, I think at that point, it's, it's definitely worth it for their quality of life to be able to see a specialist and kind of get more, um, you know, specific treatment for, you know, what they're kind of going through. Um, you know, I, I think, a lot of times, um, some of the headaches I see tend to be kind of stress related as well. And, you know, tension type headaches, um, you know, especially with, with things kind of going on today. Um, so a lot of it, you know, tends to just be kind of, um, lifestyle modifications, um, you know, trying to relax and kind of, you know, de-stress when you can, um, trying to reduce, uh, you know, like caffeine intake, alcohol intake, um, you know, diet modifications, um, tend to, you know, kind of be the first step. Um, and then if you don't see improvement with that, you know, we can kind of, uh, discuss specialty services or kind of further treatment from there. Nice. You know, de-stressing can be a challenge these days for all of us, that's for sure. And who doesn't have a headache from time to time? I'm guilty of the caffeine one, I have to admit. So, um, yeah. So then we have a lot of services for um, folks with headaches, um, neurology, surgery, and things as well. But um, I know you did mention on your, a couple of your slides, some, um, like some headaches related to neck things and uh, the specific one about occipital nerve damage. So maybe Dr. Barker, can you speak a little to that? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, very often uh, we do get quite a few patients um, with, with headaches, all different types of headaches, but uh, cervicogenic headaches is one type of headache that is often stemming from the, the neck or the upper uh, spine. And sometimes patients who have a lot of arthritis or, you know, wear and tear in those joints of the neck can kind of trigger headaches, uh, particularly in the, in the back of the head, and um, even can radiate further forward. Um, and oftentimes, you know, we try different medications and, and techniques, but unless until we treat the, the, the mechanism or the primary uh, source, if it's coming from the neck, then oftentimes they're, they're uh, kind of resistant to all these other treatments. Um, so uh, that is a very uh, frequent, frequently we see that as a culprit for a lot of different types of headaches. And then occipital neuralgia is, is a particular type of headache as well, where patients often get pain, in, again, in the back of the head. It could be on both sides or on one side, and sometimes it's tender to even touch. Uh, sometimes it's like a shocking pain as well. And we do have a very uh, simple uh, treatment often for that, where we basically just put a small little needle actually alongside the occipital nerve uh, in the back of the head there, right underneath the skin surface really um and put some local anesthetic sometimes with steroid uh to numb up around that nerve and that can really calm down those headaches uh be very very effective um and it's a simple five minute uh procedure we do actually in the office so it doesn't involve any 
any big you know machines or operating room or anything fancy like that. So it's a it's definitely something that that we see quite often. Excellent. So thanks for that question, Edna. And so short answer is yes. Um, and so if you uh, think it's pretty mild and it's not slowing you down or your family member too, too much, then Dr. Krupadev can kind of talk you through some options. And then if you feel like that um, little trigger point nerve uh, procedure Dr. Barker described might be the way to go, then um, we can get you linked up with him. Um, a couple of questions in the chat box. Um, there's one that says, I have a family member who was recently diagnosed with spinal stenosis despite being an exceptionally active, healthy, and younger person with no family history, is this common? And then what are some methods to strengthen the spine when diagnosed? So do you mind chatting a little bit about uh, how common spinal stenosis is and what the options are? Sure. So yeah, spinal stenosis, you know, despite being active and, and doing all the, the right things, you know, we, throughout your life, we often see this, uh, where it can be often a combination of, of several things. Sometimes patients, um, the spinal canal or the nerves travel uh, in the spine and some patients it happens to be a little bit more narrow than others. And so some are just a little bit more predisposed to developing stenosis or tightness really within the canal there. Um, often we see some disc bulging and alongside arthritis that can also create even further tightness within the canal that kind of often presents us the almost sometimes a perfect recipe for you know, additional tightness within the spinal canal. And at some point when there's enough tightness, and, and this can be different from patient to patient, uh, you can become symptomatic and start to have those classic symptoms of back pain or leg pain when you're standing, walking, and very often improves when you're sitting at rest. So it is a very common condition that we see. Um, and it really does, it's one of the, particularly one of the most important um, uh, I guess, conditions to really utilize a, a wide array of, of options, whether that's physical therapy, core strengthening. Um, sometimes we do epidural injections where we basically put some steroid in around those nerves to reduce the inflammation. And that's really the goal of, of that kind of procedure. So we definitely work in conjunction with the physical therapist, um, athletic training, et cetera, to, to kind of get, um, try to alleviate some of the strain there and, and then modify people's uh, activity regimen. So it's usually a, usually a team effort. And you know, sometimes patients do require surgical intervention uh, if you know, those other minimally invasive options uh, you know, fail. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for walking through that. Um, just looking through a couple other questions that came through. So there's one for Dr. Krupadev. Um, has to do with, um, again, a little bit about headaches and some over-the-counter treatments and side effects and adverse reactions, things like that. So um, as someone who has frequent headaches, I oftentimes take ibuprofen and go on with my day. I've heard taking too much can lead to stomach ulcers. Are there alternative headache relief methods you recommend rather than ibuprofen, Advil, et cetera? So maybe you could talk a little bit about the over-the-counter stuff, um, headaches and other pain stuff that you treat, and then maybe some of the downsides to taking medications like that, please. Sure. Yeah, so I know, uh, you know, those those type of medications like ibuprofen, Advil, etc. And, uh, you know, tend to be kind of the go to medications for headaches. Um, and I think those are okay if you're, you know, taking it kind of sparingly, um, you know, maybe a couple of times a week. Um, if you're getting headaches more frequently, it sounds like you are, um, you're right that, you know, it can start to tear up your stomach lining, uh, can have an effect on your kidneys as well. Um, so, you know, at that point, one option is kind of trying to alternate with Tylenol as well and, you know, try to kind of reduce uh, the NSAIDs that you're taking, the ibuprofen, uh, for example. Um, and then, you know, if it's, you know, still not really controlled, there's some people just say that, you know, ibuprofen kind of works better for them. Tylenol doesn't really touch their pain. Um, depending on the type of headache, there are more specific treatments. Um, like if it's migraines that you're having, um, you know, there's more specific treatments, it's like uh, a group of medications called tryptans that we could try out um, that, you know, won't have the, that, those side effects of uh, NSAIDs like ibuprofen. Um, and uh, in terms of, um, you know, kind of 
um, managing, you know, the side effects. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, what I wanted to say was that another thing um, that can happen if you're kind of overusing those medications is you can uh, get something called overuse uh, headaches as well. Um, so you want to make sure that you're not kind of um, overdoing it and kind of becoming resistant to those medications because that can also, you know, kind of rebound and cause um, headaches from, you know, taking too much of the medication. And to uh, delve a little into some um, controversy and a little provocative topic, let's talk a little about opiates for a bit. Obviously, those are kind of a hot topic. And I think people nowadays know a lot more about so the challenges and the um, issues with opiates. But for the longest time, that was kind of the only option we had for pain, not just headaches, but other pain conditions. So um, maybe Dr. Krupa, you can kind of chat a little bit about at what point uh, maybe not necessarily for headaches, but for other painful conditions, do you start to think about using opiates? What are some cautions that you sort of talk to folks? And then um, Dr. Barker, really curious, especially both the acute and sort of chronic pain situations. Um, is there a role for opiates? Um, and then, you know, maybe even potentially talking about if folks are have been on opiates for a while and they're not working, maybe how do we get them back off of them and do other things? So any which way you want to take it, but I'd like to talk a little bit about that because I think it'd be interesting. And uh, there's been a few questions about that as well. So maybe Dr. Krupadev, can you kind of give us your two cents on how you feel about the opiates and when you use them, when you don't? Yeah, sure. So um, I know for, you know, instance, if patients have kind of an acute issue that's, you know, very sudden kind of severe pain um, and, you know, it's just going to be kind of a short course of opioids that they would need for that condition. Um, you know, I think in that situation, uh, it's a good option, um, especially if they've kind of exhausted, you know, over the counter uh, remedies and just haven't really, you know, touched their pain. I think that that's a good option for kind of short term use. Um, I know I do uh, get, you know, a few patients that have kind of ongoing back pain um, and they're kind of, you know, asking if opioids are the right choice. And I think Dr. Barker, Barker can kind of, you know, uh, touch on this as well. But usually, you know, we try to avoid opioids as a first choice uh, for, for back pain um, and kind of try to, you know, exhaust our other options first. Um, you know, as if patients are kind of, um, you know, steadily on opioids and it's kind of become a chronic medication, um, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, something that their body kind of can potentially form a dependence on and kind of build up a tolerance to. And, you know, even if it isn't intentional, there is, you know, always kind of that potential to form uh, an addiction to it, um, unfortunately. So I think, you know, in those kind of cases, I kind of consider um, getting the opinion of pain management as well kind of on board um, just to see if um, there's anything that we can kind of tweak to try to help kind of uh, wean them off of those opioid medications and kind of substitute a more safer uh, regimen for them. Um, so I think, you know, there is definitely a utility for opioids. And I think, you know, right now it's kind of a, a touchy subject because, you know, I know a lot of people tr try to just kind of avoid them completely uh, because of that potential to form independence. Um, but I do think there is, you know, certain situations in which it can be, you know, utilized very well. Great. Now, yeah, well said, that's for sure. And I know as an ER doctor, when people would come in with crooked, broken parts, you were very happy to be able to give them a little relief when parts were pointing in directions they weren't meant to point, but uh, good for short term. And man, I wish we had better stuff without all the downsides, but uh, they definitely have their drawbacks for sure. So I know Dr. Barker, that's probably a big area that you spent a lot of time with your education and pain management and how to best optimize um, or potentially avoid. So maybe you can give us your two cents on the, uh, the opiates, good, bad, and ugly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's a, um, it is one of those challenging topics and um, I definitely had a lot of experience, you know, with opiates, both in the operating room and outside the operating room doing anesthesia. Um, and I do think um, there is definitely a role uh, more in the acute phase of an injury, like you were describing in the ER um, there, you know, with, with chronic use or long-term use, there's a, a host of concerns, some being, tolerance where, you know, the same dose doesn't quite provide the same effect as it once did. And, and traditionally people would go up on the dose and up on a dose and then you know, kind of a slippery slope there often. Um, and then also the concern for dependence um, where now your body is expecting this medication and without it, you can have quite severe uh, reactions and withdrawals. And so Another, you know, important uh, aspect with, with long-term or uh, use of, of narcotic medication or opiates is um, kind of this phenomenon called hyperalgesia, which really is kind of just a fancy word for 
it almost kind of almost heightens your, your central nervous system to kind of perceive pain almost more readily, which sometimes sounds counterintuitive uh, when you're taking a pain medication. But these medications work essentially, they work in the brain, the central nervous system. And, you know, over time, you know, our bodies adapt. And, and one of the things that that can occur with, with long term use of these medications is um, a, a progressive um, or difficulty actually managing all, all types of pain, all different types of pain, where it becomes more readily um, felt or experienced. And so um, I, I think we know a lot more now than we did even, you know, a decade ago or, you know, about these medications. And, and, and we've also been shown to, that even in chronic pain states, they really don't provide uh, significant benefit. Um, it, they're really, um, there's a lot of alternative options that are out these days, whether it be, um, you know, ner nerve medications, one of which is called gabapentin or neurontin, which sometimes is actually a, a much more effective medication uh, to, to treat various types of pain um, that, that, that does not come with those other kind of, uh, you know, side effects or addiction potential or tolerance, et cetera. Um, as well as other classes of medication that we use for pain. So such as the antidepressant class of medications, many of which have been proven to be very, very effective in managing chronic pain states, particularly uh, pain that might be stemming from a nerve. Um, and, and very often, you know, working with a, a pain specialist or a family physician that you can, we can figure out a, a much more effective regimen uh, to, to really target the, the actual um, pain source as opposed to kind of blocking it, uh, you know, in the brain, or if you will, with, with narcotics. And, and, and very often those are more effective actually managing the pain in the long run. So, so I think kind of to the, the summarize, it's really, it, there are, you know, times when you have an acute injury, a spine fracture, an acute disc herniation, you might have lifted something heavy and suddenly a, a disc started to bulge in your back and you have really severe leg pain. Um, those situations definitely, uh, you know, it makes sense to have, you know, a short course of medication while we, you know, get other things going. Um, but, but there hasn't been much evidence or, uh, you know, or to really show that, that chronic narcotics are, are very beneficial for, for most pain states, most chronic pain. Yeah, perfect. That totally makes sense. So um, clearly you can see we always are weighing what are the potential harms, what are the risks, what are the downsides versus what are the potential benefits. And I think you can see examples of that. So like Dr. Krupa mentioned, even some of the over-counter medications like ibuprofen and non-steroidal NSAIDs can hurt your stomach, they can hurt your kidneys, they can cause some issues. And opiates, I think, are even more magnified on both sides of that one. Um, we actually had two questions that are in a similar sort of category about sort of non-pharmacologic type interventions. So there was questions about products on the market like Theraguns and foam rollers and sort of thoughts on those. And um, the question about could they be improperly used or used too much? And then uh, another question about acupuncture, other treatments like that. Um, the question was specifically about spinal stenosis, but um, maybe I'll start with Dr. Krupadev. Um, do you either recommend or do you have any kind of scripting that you go through in terms of alternate therapies like acupuncture or like these um, sort of, um, you know, therapy, third guns, foam rollers, things like that for people who are in pain or uncomfortable. And then we'll kick it over to Dr. Barker to see what he says about those sorts of things. Yeah. I mean, I, I can tell you when I first moved to Newport, I actually threw my back out moving in and actually the, the Theragun was, was great for me. Um, I think it was, it was a really good option uh, taking that, you know, along with, uh, you know, Tylenol or kind of ibuprofen as needed and trying to just do, you know, some stretches at home, I think was, you know, really helpful. So I think, um, you know, there is definitely a market for, you know, these alternate kind of approaches. Um, and I've had, you know, patients tell me that they do acupuncture uh, for their back pain and they get a lot of relief with that when, you know, other kind of remedies have failed for them. Um, so I do think, you know, there is there's a place for those type of things. Um, and I think, you know, physical therapy is also, uh, you know, a great option as well for chronic pain. Um, and that's kind of, you know, a, a great option that's non-pharmaceutical as well. Yeah, awesome. Hey, 
you know, the, one of the questions that was about Theragun's and foam rollers were, can they be used improperly or too much? And I would go so far as to say, I'd have to get pretty creative to think how you'd hurt yourself with a foam roller, maybe at the top of the stairs or something like that. But I can tell you the original generation Theragun is kind of like a jackhammer. I mean, it was like the first electric toothbrush. It had, definitely had a long ways to go. The new ones are pretty, pretty nice, but man, if you put the wrong thing on it and you give it to a 10 year old and they point it at your back, you can definitely do some damage with that thing. So be cautious on the business end of a Theragun. That's my, my sort of end of one study on receiving a Theragun from a, a, a young age child. So I wouldn't recommend a youthful operator, I guess would be my uh, story on that one. But yeah, Dr. Barker, your thoughts on those. And that's a good point that you kind of overlap with physical therapy and our therapists use some of those tools and then maybe some acupuncture and other things that you work with. Sure. Yeah. And I, I'm a huge proponent um, of kind of all of these alternative modalities to, you know, stay conservative and, and, and avoid, you know, anything more invasive. I think whatever might work, you know, for some patients, I, you know, whether it's yoga, Pilates, uh, Tai Chi and, and, and um, you know, all of these things have been shown, particularly um, acupuncture. There's been some a lot of great studies to support. Uh, it's used in a whole variety of, of, uh, of both pain conditions and stress, anxiety. And um, so I, I'm always um, uh, a proponent when someone, uh, you know, brings up some of these uh, options. I, one thing I do always kind of caution patients is particularly with acupuncture, it's, you know, it's not something you can do once and, and then have a determine whether or not it's going to be effective for you. You really need to that in particular, you need to give, you know, six sessions at least um, to, to really understand if this is something that might be effective for, for you. So um, a lot of this is a, is a process and that's the same with physical therapy, was it massage therapy, et cetera. It's, um, you know, it, it's, it's kind of a, the game plan, but it can take time and, and it may be subtle changes along the way. And so oftentimes these aren't quick fixes, but but it, nonetheless, a really important aspect to the, to the plan. Excellent. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know if anybody is uh, Tom Brady fans anymore since he kind of moved along, but he does a lot of the sort of stretch it, then massage it, then exercise it, rinse and repeat kind of a thing. And I can tell you, you know, when you've got an area like Dr. Krupadev, when you hurt your back and things like that, I, it's uh, definitely my first go-to line to kind of combination stretch massage and a little bit of light exercise range of motion you can usually bring things back on track once the pain is to a point where you can tolerate doing that kind of stuff so definitely my uh first second and third line options for things and then uh, i usually try to avoid even the ibuprofens and tylenols unless i absolutely need them because uh, it doesn't really fix the problem just kind of takes it down a notch but sometimes you need that as well um, so I had a question for you guys. Uh, do I actually need to get out of bed and come see you guys in the office or do either one of you do virtual visits? And I'm kind of curious your experience. Uh, if you've been doing those, how well does it work? Maybe a little harder for Dr. Barker with uh, trying to reach a needle all the way to my house for procedures, but I'm just curious. So maybe Dr. Krupadev, how have things been going with virtual visits? I'm going to try to avoid talking at all this whole session about any pandemics and viruses. So I won't even say the C word, but um, let's pretend for a minute, like there's some real good public health reason why people would want to stay at home and see you from their computer. How does that work? Yeah. So, you know, we have been trying to switch as many patients as we can to virtual visits just to, you know, keep you guys at home, keep you guys safe out of medical facilities. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely ideal. Um, if, if the patient has a way to do a video visit, just so we can kind of at least have some kind of, you know, face-to-face -face encounter um, and be able to, you know, somewhat do a physical exam, um, you know, even if it's just kind of observing an area that might be, you know, need to be kind of examined. Um, you know, it, it is, you know, less ideal than, you know, being able to kind of have you guys in the, in the clinic, um, but it is, you know, a good alternative, uh, you know, for, for the kind of conditions that we're in right now. Um, and I think we can still kind of have, you know, very meaningful discussions, uh, you know, through a virtual visit. Um, and a lot of, you know, the kind of screening and preventative uh, discussions are still, you know, just as effective through a virtual visit as it would be, you know, in person. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's, to be honest, I think it's something that's probably going to stick around even, you know, after, you know, the pandemic has kind of quieted down. I think it is a good alternative, especially for patients who kind of, you know, don't have reliable transportation or kind of, it's just, you know, kind of a struggle or a chore to kind of, you know, make their way into the clinic. 
Um, so I think it is a good option for patients to be able to, you know, kind of still get medical care, but from the comfort of their own home. So nice. Yeah, I know we've definitely seen in behavioral health in a few areas where, um, you know, like you said, just having somebody to chat with and being able to do a visit like that, <clears throat> the no show rates have just dropped to zero. People are much more comfortable. So I've definitely seen it in some pockets where, you know, it really has been a, a a lifesaver for some people. I know, Dr. Barker, do you do much for virtual visits? Any way we can see you without having to come all the way to see you? And then at what point do you switch gears where you want to see me in, in real life? Sure, sure. So we, we definitely do. Um, we, we try not to so much as a new patient. Um, if it's your first time, you know, uh, meeting myself, uh, you know, we really like to see a, in the office if possible because it's really difficult to sometimes obviously do a physical exam through the computer and, and particularly for, you know, chronic pain conditions or spine pain, that's, that's a critical component. Um, and, and so, you know, definitely before we would even think about doing any kind of interventional procedures or anything along those lines, I would definitely want to, uh, you know, see it in the clinic and make sure that, you know, all the exam findings are consistent with, with, with everything else. But, but that said, you know, we definitely do a, a fair number of, of telemedicine or virtual visits um, sometimes to review, uh, diagnostic studies, whether it be an MRI that we, uh, ordered. Um, I still always love to kind of go through the images with, with patients. Uh, I always pull up the, the pictures on the screen and go through them, um, uh, because I think that really, really is effective in, in helping patients and helping you understand really what's going on and what's driving the pain. And, um, so I do appreciate the ability to do that when we can, um, but understand there's, there's obviously some, some limitations and reasons to have virtual visits. So, you know, when, when needed for sure, we can definitely review stuff over the phone. Um, or if it's a follow-up for a, a medication that we started on or follow up even after a procedure, those are definitely, uh, much more kind of easy to, or easier visits, I should say to, that we can do, uh, virtually. Nice. Well, that's really helpful to know. Thank you. And I can say as an ER doctor, just from friends in the neighborhood, I've been doing free telemedicine and the occasional text message with a picture of somebody's kid and the, what I call the, should I stay or should I go scenario of, is this bang to the face, something that needs to go to the hospital? Cause I really don't want to go to the hospital. So I've been doing free telemedicine for friends for a little while, but it is nice to have it a little bit more formal because um, clearly that was pretty subpar. So it's good that they can actually, um, have a chat either by phone or even throw some video, see your face, do a little interaction when appropriate. But I agree, nothing beats being able to do an exam, sit down with patients, really get a sense of what it is that they need. So whenever possible, we always try to get you in face-to-face, -face, but um, definitely something we can take advantage of as well. Um, we had a question that came in um, for Dr. Krupada following up to that piece that I mentioned that you did about sleep. Um, the specific thing was about kind of sleep disorders, um, things like that with diagnosis and problems with sleep. And then there were some questions about dreams and specifically lucid dreaming. So that's one I'm not too familiar with. I don't know if you are a dream expert or not. That one's a good one. So maybe you could talk a little bit about the piece you did about sleep. So maybe some takeaways that you thought were important. And then can you comment on dreams and lucid dreaming and other sleep disorders? Sure. Yeah. So um, the piece that I did was a lot about sleep hygiene. Uh, which is, you know, basically just kind of practices, um, you know, throughout the day, as well as, you know, prior to bed to kind of make sure that you're going to get the best quality of sleep that you can. Um, so it's a lot of, um, you know, trying to cut out caffeine and alcohol, you know, several hours before bed, um, before bed, trying to kind of um, turn off all your screens, uh, try not to, you know, watch TV before bed, try not to look at your phone. I know I'm, I'm guilty of doing these things before bed as well, but um, and, you know, trying to kind of do things to help relax your body, whether it's, you know, breathing exercises, meditation, uh, drinking sleepy time tea, um, just kind of preparing your, your brain for bed. Um, and the other big thing is um, a lot of patients tell me that, you know, when they go to bed, they just kind of lay there for hours and are unable to fall asleep. Um, so, you know, I'd recommend kind of getting out of bed after, you know, 20 minutes or so if you aren't able to fall asleep and try to you know, leave the room and try to do something relaxing and then uh, come back to bed when you feel ready to fall asleep. Um, just to kind of trick your brain into, you know, associating your bed uh, stri strictly for sleep and, you know, not kind of uh, doing other things in bed that, you know, 
your brain might associate with, you know, we're in bed, we don't necessarily need to be asleep right now. Um, so it's a, a lot of, you know, um, those kind of, you know, practices to just kind of get quality sleep. Um, and then, you know, I kind of discussed, uh, there's a few medications that, uh, you know, might be, you know, useful to try to help sleep. Um, one is melatonin that you can kind of use as needed. Um, melatonin is something that your body kind of naturally uh, produces and uh, it's kind of a, a thing to help you relax and kind of, you know, prepare you for sleep. Um, so that's, that's kind of, you know, a natural um, medication that you could try out. Um, and then if we need to, if it's, you know, kind of an ongoing problem, um, you just aren't getting enough sleep and you're kind of doing everything right in terms of sleep hygiene, um, then, you know, we can kind of discuss um, medication options, um, like more long-term medications that we could try out. Um, and then in terms of lucid dreams, uh, to be honest, I don't, <laughs> I don't know too much about lucid dreaming. Um, but, you know, definitely if it's something where you're kind of, you know, reenacting dreams or, you know, I've heard of, you know, people sleepwalking, kind of getting into dangerous situations. Um, you know, that's something that might warrant a sleep study um, to kind of see if you're having like night terrors or, you know, what's kind of bringing that on. So, um, but not too familiar with lucid dreaming, to be honest. Yeah, I have to say I'm not too either, although I did read Why We Sleep, which was kind of an interesting book. Um, at one point, I went down a rabbit hole of all the pillars of health and sleep being a big one. Um, and I don't know if they touch specifically on lucid dreams, but they do talk about sleep quality and REM sleep and the sort of deeper and shallower stages of sleep and the sleep cycles and all that kind of stuff. So if um, you're interested and you have the energy um, for any of the listeners, that would be a cool one to read. Um, but I do know that some of the things like you mentioned, alcohol in particular, um, caffeine, medications, things like that, sometimes you can get what you think is good sleep, but it's lower quality sleep. And then weird things can start to happen. So you just have to be really careful because not all sleep is created equal. Um, so I know we had a chance to talk a little bit about what I sort of call the pillars of health. We talked about sleep. Um, we talked about exercise. We talked about nutrition. So I think if you're eating right, you're exercising and keeping somewhat mobile. And if you have conditions that make that hard to do, then we have some docs that can kind of help navigate that. And if you can kind of do the sleep hygiene tips that Dr. Krupp would have mentioned in her piece, and you can hopefully get yourself a good night's sleep, then I think all those things will combine together towards some good mental health. Um, I agree the meditation, the relaxation, things like that, things that I've found super helpful. And I teach my kids the same thing because harder and harder to shut the brain off these days with all the stuff going on in the world. So um, with that being said, we've got a couple minutes left. I'll kind of do a quick round robin and see any last minute thoughts, things you'd like to share with the community, um, folks that could potentially be your patients, um, things that you'd like them to know either about you or your practice or what you do. Um, before we wrap up, we'll start with Dr. Barker. Any last minute thoughts or things you'd like to share with the community? Sure. So, yeah, I mean, I just want to make sure that everyone knows that we are, you know, here and, um, you know, even if it might be something that you don't think we see or it might not be related to the spine necessarily, uh, more than happy to meet with you. Um, and, and, and even if it's not something that we treat uh, with procedures or whatnot, um, I think we can find a way to kind of make you hopefully put you in the right direction with the right people. Um, because I know sometimes with chronic pain conditions, it's, it's not always clear. Is this you know, I, some people often come in with hip pain or on the side of their leg and don't think it has anything to do with their back because they don't have any back pain. Um, and, and very often it, it may be actually stemming from the spine. And so just wanted to make sure that, you know, everyone knows that we are um, happy to, 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 to almost get any referral to evaluate someone's chronic pain condition. Um, and, you know, and see what we can do collectively uh, as a team at the, at the Spine Institute to, to work and getting you feeling better and, and back to those activities that you, that you enjoy. Awesome. Yeah. Don't suffer. Um, if you're in pain, then, you know, if we can't fix it, we can definitely get you pointed in the right direction, at least help you be more comfortable. So um, please call. I know we, um, Dr. Parker had it on his slide. We can share the number too when we put out the recording and things. Um, and it's on our website at newporthospital.org. Dr. Krupadev, what sort of things in your world uh, would you like to share? Any last uh, comments before we wrap up? Yeah, um, I mean, I think one thing that I would recommend for my patients that 
um, you know, a few patients have done for me that is just very helpful is, um, you know, just try to make a list of kind of things that you want to discuss with me uh, when you come into your visits. Um, because usually, you know, I have kind of the, the points that I want to touch on and the kind of things that I want to discuss. Um, but definitely want to make sure that you kind of, you know, get all of your concerns addressed as well. And that, you know, it's kind of an equal discussion and that, you know, we're addressing all your concerns. And I'm also kind of, you know, addressing my health concerns for you as well. So I think uh, that's just really helpful um, to kind of have an agenda for the visit um, and just want to say, you know, thank you for having me and, you know, for letting me be a part of this. Awesome. Yeah, no, I like that trick. That's great. And uh, I know whenever ever I, you're again, in the ER is a little bit less common, but if you ever have a diagnosis that's something complicated, then I often would encourage people to get a little journal or a notebook or things to kind of jot down on this day. I got my MRI on this day. I saw this doctor that was more just for keeping track of your progress as things go along. But I really love that idea of preparing for a visit, jotting down, making sure that any of the questions that you might have, um, you have a good organized thing. So uh, yeah, doctors can be a little bit like comets. They come every 25 years and fly by. And if you blink, you can miss them. So, and I know about you, but my mind always goes blank on those situations. And I'd forget a bunch of the questions I thought of the night before when I was tossing and turning and trying to sleep. So Great tip. I like that. You can use that for either Dr. Barker or Dr. Krupadev. Um, and then uh, I think Eric put in, I don't know if everybody can see it, just a funny little uh, remark about thanking you guys for coming and wants to read your piece on sleep as it's one of his favorite activities. So um, I would concur with that. So to that end, we will let people get back to their evening so they can spend a few hours off the screen um, and get ready for a good night's sleep. So I just wanted to say a huge thank you to Dr. Krupada for all you do in the community and primary care and keeping folks healthy, um, keeping them out of the hospital. I wish we could close the whole building down and just make a cookie factory out of it. Um, but for those that need it, um, sending them to see Dr. Barker and thank you for what you do in terms of managing folks with really, really uh, uncomfortable conditions, pain that really slows them down and bringing them back to their good health and their activities that they love to do. So it's pretty magical, some of the tricks you can do. Um, and so we're awesome, very awesome, struck to have you on our staff and the, the tools that you have um, and bringing those to the community as well. It's kind of fun, just a little community hospital like Newport, um, some of the services that you went through that we can offer. So um, really proud to have you guys on the team. Thank you very much. And uh, on my behalf, I'm excited to host the next virtual community lecture series. We'll be doing these as close to monthly as we can. And we've got a good lineup of some um, specialists coming up in the next few months as well. So thank you to all the attendees that signed in. And we will circulate the recording as well. So people have a chance to kind of hear the questions and answers. Huge thank you for both of you for joining. We'll let, wish everybody a good evening and we'll connect again next month. Thanks, guys. We'll see you around town and see you in the hospital.